Hey, let's start a little series here called something like um, the multiple M's of Mormonism. And here we'll, well, maybe we'll go with Book of Mormon Geometry. No, yeah, Book of Mormon Geometry rather than Book of Mormon Geography. Book of Mormon Geometry and the Mathematics of the Multiple M's of Mormonism. Well, I want to cover a lot of things that many people haven't probably heard of, and some of us have, but they've gotten a spin on them. And I want to talk a little bit about how information gets manipulated in order to manipulate and control the way we perceive things. Just something I learned about as a young person when I saw <clears throat> tactics that were used to limit the effectiveness of people who were exposing truths about how the world was working, especially in the United States, that folks in power didn't want to be disclosed accurately. So I saw how <clears throat> information was manipulated and how character assassination and, and various powers of language were used to neutralize the opposition to those in power who were pulling the strings behind the scenes. And I've seen this carried out in more than just more than just uh, society at large. So, some of the things we're going to cover here. Magic in Mormonism. The magical history. Joseph Smith, his involvement in practicing magic. And his family and friends discussing that. Gonna, as far as geometry goes, Two points intersecting, giving coordinates, can locate a place on the globe. If you've got your north-south plus your east-west coordinates, you can pinpoint something. If you've got multiple testimonies from divergent sources on the actions and activities or characteristics of a person or an organization that corroborate those certain points then you can pretty accurately identify some things that are going on and we've got we've got um, some interesting things there we've got multiple sources of uh, original source material about church history about Joseph Smith for instance that we don't get in Sunday school and they're going to corroborate a story a history that is not told in church and I had studied a lot of LDS doctrine shall I say including the book Mormon doctrine and many books by Bruce R. McConkie who's an in-law, I believe, relative of Joseph Fielding Smith, who's, who was also an apostle and became president of the church and was church historian. Bruce McConkie was a very outspoken, prolific writer and speaker, and many others. And I found later that things didn't match up. And there's a reason we got a very powerful powerful organization in the church, a conglomerate of corporations that include media, a PR department that's talented and huge, got radio, television, newspaper. Church is, the, church is very involved with creating an image and very involved, very uh, diligent in its correlation of materials to 
guide what we see and read and learn about the church's history. And it directs us to certain points, but obscures and makes it difficult to locate much of its early history. The church has morphed from the church that Joseph Smith originally founded, the Church of Christ, in 1830, which we can see was teaching uh, a Trinitarian, monotheistic theology. It was practicing charismatic, charismatic uh, evangelical Christianity and moved into doctrines that were taught by Emanuel Swedenborg, a spiritualist, and other doctrines that are actually have a lot in common with Luciferian doctrines found in high-level Freemasonry and the mystery religions from which Masonry and Rosicrucianism is sourced. We see evidence of Masonic influence early in the church and in the Book of Mormon or in, in, in things that Joseph Smith published various works and scriptures long before he actually became a Freemason. When we look at other organizations we can say oh well those guys were into the occult why they were 33rd degree Freemasons. Well, if we look at people in high level Christianity, uh, you look at people like uh, Oral Roberts, Billy Graham, Robert Schuller, you know, Pat Robertson. Most of these guys are high-level Freemasonry, and that's occultic. When we look at the founder of the Watchtower and Tracks, Bible Tract Society, better known as the Jehovah's Witnesses, an occultist and 32nd or 33rd degree Freemason. <sighs> Charles uh, Russell, Charles Taze Russell, associated with the Russell family that founded Yale and where Skull and Bones is, which is, you know, associated with being a coven, witchcraft, and other, <coughs> other occultic, uh, secret combinations, shall we say, certain secret societies. So it's easy when we look outside, but we think Joseph Smith, he was just a pure innocent boy. Why we have the story of the first vision and Heavenly Father and Jesus appearing to him in his first uttered prayer in the sacred grove as he sought truth after having gone to various religious revival camp meetings that were held in his area. Unfortunately for the story, they weren't at the time that he said they were for his 1820 vision. And there are many historical issues with that, such as him saying his mom and siblings enjoyed the Presbyterian Church prior to his first vision. And that they did that in 1824, so after Alvin had died in 1823 and they sought religion. We've talked about that in another video. But here we're going to start off with how the history of the church really seems to have happened according to original source materials and how that diverges from how lovely was the morning in the sacred grove and the Moroni coming to Joseph Smith who appears in the picture there to be all alone in his bedroom when there were about four of his brothers there two of them in his same bed 
all the boys occupied the upper room there in the Smith's small three-bedroom home where they had about nine children. It's not like we look at in the pictures. Pictures show a different story. Here we can look at the 13 little <clears throat> mini spires on each spire. We won't get much into that of the occultic symbols, the pentagrams, sunstones, and various other things on the chapter on the temple right now. Well, what about this guy here? The seer stone. The brown seer stone that Joseph Smith used in his hat to translate the Book of Mormon. Hey, the missionaries didn't tell me about that. They said he used the Urim and Thummim. They were some kind of spectacles, special magic glasses that he looked at the plates with, weren't they? Hmm. This is what I heard. There he is looking at those golden plates. There he is. The one on the left, he's got some special magic spectacles there. There he is with Oliver Cowdery, probably. That's what I heard. But wait a minute. We've got corroborating information from his mother, his wife, the, the witnesses, Martin Harris and David Whitmer, Joseph Smith's father-in-law, Isaac Hale, and others to talk about a very different history. A history that included this. That's right. He's got the rock in the hat and that's how Emma, David Whitmer, and Martin Harris all say he translated the Book of Mormon. Not even looking at the plates. Why did the missionaries tell me that? This picture saying if he put in his face in the hat to look at a stone, did he even need the plates? Why did Mormon and Moroni go to all that trouble? If he was just going to put his face in his hat the same way he did to find buried treasure, which his father-in-law and his employer describe. Richard Bushman, pretty much a, almost a church apologist, a, a church historian who's very active LDS, wrote a biography not too long ago on Joseph Smith, trying to be as favorable as he could to overcome some of the things that Fawn Brody, the niece of David O. McKay, wrote about Joseph Smith. But they reached some, many of the same conclusions, seen much of the same material. He states that Joseph Smith was notorious for tall tales in necromantic arts. Mystic brooding over visions and involved with treasure seeking. Contemporary diaries and newspaper reports and histories indicate that thousands of early Americans participated in treasure digging nationwide. A small number of them actually took the lead in practicing various forms of divination and magic. Instead of using ground penetrating radar, they were contacting spirits. This is a picture of magical parchment belonging to the Smith family that they used in ceremonial magic. Let's look at one of our mathematical coordinates here. The mother of Joseph Smith, Lucy Mack. Stories had been circulated because someone, uh, <clears throat> I think it was uh, E.B. Howe, and with the help of uh, Philastrus Hurlbut, can you imagine that name, had, uh, collect, had, had written a book and discrediting Joseph Smith, and had some of the neighbors talk about his character, saying that he was lazy. Well, Joseph's mom says, we weren't lazy. So for the book, they gathered uh, about 50 signatures on an affidavit, I think. Stating Joseph was just a lazy necromancer, a magician who practiced treasure seeking by night mostly. And his mom said, hey, sure our family practiced magic, but hey, we weren't lazy. We had time for the farming and other things. 
So we're going to look at the details and the testimonies of his family and friends about Joseph the Magician. Next video.